Hello, is this thing on? Do you think they can hear us? Nah, let's say it again. Hi, and welcome to the Gritty Nurse Podcast, an unfiltered discussion related to health and healthcare. My name is Amy. And my name is Sarah. And we are your podcast hosts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, or any other podcast listening platform, don't forget to subscribe so you can get updates to when we have our latest episodes. Also, don't forget to rate and review us. And if you like what you're hearing and you love our advocacy work, don't forget to go to www.grittynurse.com and click on the donate button. As little as $1 or $2 a month for a total of $12 a year will help us with our monthly podcast costs such as website hosting, our hosting platform, audio equipment, and the time and energy it takes us to put out good quality episodes. We thank you and we appreciate you. Hi and welcome everyone. I just wanted to start out by saying what a week it's been. I think just from a mental health standpoint, I'm I'm glad that we'll be talking about mental health and, you know, we've got to keep our eye and our pulse on this because I feel that, you know, um, things aren't getting any easier. I, I know the numbers are changing, but I think the mental health aspect and role has still been really heavy on on all healthcare workers. But, you know, we want to talk about a story today by a really, really great nurse that we had the opportunity to speak with previously. And I, and I want to share her story with you so you guys can have a sense of, you know, what, what can we do during these times, especially when it comes to mental health? How do we protect ourselves? How do we look at other people, use other people's stories as, as a, as a means of saying, okay, this is, a, this is time to change the way we do things. So without further ado, I'd actually like to introduce our guest. We have Cheryl Beamer here today, but maybe what I'll do is, Cheryl, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and give us a brief overview of your nursing career? Thanks, Amy. Um, I've been a registered nurse for 35 years, diploma educated. I've always um, been a direct care provider, so I've been at the bedside for the 35 years, or 34 years, actually. And um, I worked in a surgery and trauma floor to start, but then I found where I really belonged was in cardiac care. I spent 16 years in a cardiac care unit and then another 15 years in the cardiac catheterization lab. Often I, um, I wonder why I didn't move around very much, but I think I found a patient population that I enjoyed, um, taking care of. I got a lot of job satisfaction in that area and, um, I just stayed. I also have been involved with different nursing organizations within the province of Ontario. I've always been a supporter of the Ontario Nurses Association, always knew my collective agreement and always um, advocated for the nurses in my work areas. Um, Never held a position with the union, though, um, just a supporter of them um, and what they did for us. I was on two best practice guidelines with the RNAO on the panels for them. Um, They were both workload and staffing. I did some work with the Canadian Nurses Association. Um, I wrote some uh, multiple choice exam questions for the old um, national examination, not the NCLEX. And um, I also marked some short answer questions um, for that organization. And I also was elected five times to the College of Nurses um, for Council and Committee. So um, I was part of the regulatory um, body in the province for 15 years, basically. That is really impressive, Cheryl. I think that throughout your career, you've done a lot at the bedside, but also you've taken on all these extra roles in terms of bettering the profession. And it seems like you had your um, feet in many different places. So that is really impressive. I think that when Amy and I get to this stage of our careers, whenever <laughs> that might be, we could roll off something as impressive as yours. Right, and, absolutely. <laughs> and I think this just really goes to show you that because Amy and I always talk about how your role doesn't end at the bedside, right? Like there's so much more you can do. And I think people just sometimes are not sure of what that is, or they don't know how to get started, or maybe there's a bit of fear there. Like it sounds like throughout your career, you've always been involved in these extra activities that you've done. I think that's probably why I never went back to school to get my BSCN or do any further education because I was involved in all these other organizations and and I, I got a lot of satisfaction out of doing them and I don't think I really needed anything. And plus I knew I, I was probably never going to 
do anything other than bedside nursing. That was what I feel I was cut out to do. And I wasn't going to be a manager and I wasn't going to be an educator. The only thing I really would have liked to do is be somewhere in professional practice, but I wasn't prepared to get my PhD for that. I hear you. That's a huge, huge commitment. Mm -hmm. And kudos there out there to anybody who is working on their PhD or has their PhD mm -hmm. because it's, um, you know, five years full time or I had actually a professor in graduate school who did it part time 10 years. Mm -hmm. So 10 years of part time PhD studies. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking, uh, maybe, Cheryl, we could dive into another topic. I know that you had shared with us some uh, mental health struggles or um, stories that you've had around bullying throughout your career as a nurse. Just wondering if you wanted to share any of those stories with us. Yes, um, I have to say throughout um, most of my career, I've always been able to manage my mental health. Um, I've had a very supportive husband who understood nursing. And that's very helpful. And I also um, had a good core group of um, nursing sisters that I call them um, that I met very early on in my career. And, and they're still very close to me now. And, you know, to have those people as sounding blocks, it always helps. But when I reflect back on my career and my education, there was never anything ever given to me in education or by my employer to help me to um, to give me strategies to cope with some of the stressors that we see um, every day in our in our workplaces. I spent many half hour rides home, commuting, crying in the car um, as a way to cope. And I think I think if anybody has um, empathy toward others, which I would hope you would as a nurse, that there's lots of moments that you do cry like that, um, of cases that you've had or people that you've taken care of that um, you weren't able to save, th those kinds of things. And and when I reflect on my whole career, I, I think if I didn't have those people in my, in my camp helping me, I don't know how I would have gotten through it. Yeah, I think that's something that still persists today because when I went through school, we never touched really upon mental health of nurses or of healthcare workers. We definitely didn't talk about bullying. There was a component of mental health, but of course that was the mental health component of looking after patients in mental health. But it just, we never talked about the other side of the coin, which I think is so important. And it was just something that had to be learned on the job and it wasn't really openly discussed. I think it's a little bit more discussed now, but it's still, we still have a long way to go in terms of mental health. And even my own struggle and Amy's struggle um, with mental health, we didn't feel very supported by our employers. And I think that there's just, I don't know what it is. It's just ironic that we as healthcare workers, we give so much to other people. And when it comes time for us, when we need support, it's not always there. And I know in other industries, they provide a lot more mental health support to their employees. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, I mean, I think the the problem still persists today, right? I mean, the fact that we're going through this pandemic for whatever reason. I don't. I don't hear mental health being talked and discussed about. And I think a lot of nurses can empathize with you of you know having that time where, you know, you've had such a difficult shift and the way that you cope is to cry in your car before you leave work. Like I, I think a lot of us can have had that experience, and it's it's kind of unfortunate because yeah, you know, you really hope that if you have such a highly stressful job that employers and the people that are supposed to be looking after you actually looks after you, not just your physical health, but your mental health. And it is, again, you know, this this elephant in the room. And I, I don't hear a, a lot of it on media. I don't hear them talking about that. I hear them talking about the overwhelming burden, but they don't talk about the moral injury and the moral distress that, you know, um, healthcare workers face. And I think that, to be honest, organizations do a really crap job of actually looking after their staff. And I think this probably is more telling with your story. So maybe you could kind of give us a little bit more information in terms of, you know, what exactly you experienced on your end. Well, um, about 32 years into my career, um, a few years ago, um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And he was only given um, um, about nine months to live. So that that alone was challenging me. But um, unbeknownst to me, my husband was experiencing some TIA symptoms. And he had gone to see the family doctor. And the family doctor had booked him into the local stroke clinic. And I remember it was a Friday because um, I was going to see my dad before uh, my husband and I were um, heading out on a trip to the Yukon and Northwest Territories. And, um, I, he goes, no, go see your dad. I'll go to the clinic. It's just a precaution. 
I got to my parents' house, which was about an hour and 20 minutes away, and my dad had worsened. And I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to have to cancel our trip. He's not going to, he's not going to make it. And he had just said to my mom and me, would you mind if I gave up because I just can't take this breathing anymore? And the phone rang and it was my husband on the phone from the stroke clinic saying that I had to come right away. They were admitting him. He had 100% blocked carotid um, artery on one side and 50% on the other. So um, I was quite distressed. My sister had to drive me to the hospital. Um, He got admitted the next day they did an emergent carotid endarterectomy on him. So the doctor actually said to me, it was really bad. And I knew him. So um, he was being quite honest with me. So that frightened me even more that he told me that. So I thought of how I could have lost my husband, you know, in a minute, and especially not in a canoe up in the yellow knife where we were going. He was about five days in hospital. Um, I got home, he was well enough that I could go and see my dad. And my dad, I think was just waiting to make sure that my husband was okay. My dad died the next day. And then two weeks after that, my father-in-law died. So I was not in any position that I could actually go back to work and care for people in the way that, that I should be caring for them. I had difficulty concentrating. I watched a lot of birds out the front window. I have to say that it had really thrown me for a loop. So um, I filled out the appropriate paperwork. My family doctor is fabulous and was very supportive um, of me because he knew me um, as a person. I had had very little sick time in my 32 years working. Some years I had no sick time. I filled out the proper paperwork and then I just waited. I heard from somebody from the abilities once and um, I didn't hear from my manager at all. I then received a letter saying that I should call them because they'd been trying to call me on my cell phone, which I don't use very much and I use my home phone and that's what the ho- the um, hospital had listed. So they didn't call me on the proper phone. I didn't answer the cell phone or call back because I didn't know the numbers. I did um, call once I got the letter, but then no one called me back. And it, I didn't hear from them again until I received a letter, registered mail from them, telling me that I had been on unauthorized leave and did I still want my employment after I'd been there for 32 years and no person had phoned to see how I was after all I'd been through. I was I was stunned when I got this letter. I, I called the union right away. I didn't know what to do. I don't have any words. Like, I mean... You think that as nurses and in healthcare that we'd have more compassion, right? I think this is one of the things that myself and Sarah kind of found that, you know, for whatever reason, there's a lack of compassion when it comes to nurses and when it comes to these situations where, you know, like you said, you were working for 32 plus years with this organization. They probably knew you very well and knew the type of worker that you were. Clearly you were dedicated to especially the fact that you mentioned that you don't, you you barely took any sick time. I think that's actually something that's very relatable because a lot of nurses just, they power through because, you know, we, we feel a sense of obligation, but when it comes to the, when the rubber meets the road and, you know, we need the time, we don't get the time. And I think that it's, that was the worst thing that your organization could have done. And I'm sorry that you experienced that. Yeah, I was sorry too, because I felt almost betrayed by them that Mm -hmm. I had given loyalty to this organization provided excellent care to my patients and, and showed up for my shifts on time. And like, I I was a good employee. And I, I thought, how can I be treated this way? Why? Why are you doing this to me? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost similar to my situation where when I was working for an organization, I remember kind of when the rubber hit the road for me where I already was being gaslit. I was already going through this kind of bullying and harassment with uh, this previous employer that I was with. And I remember um, being so fearful that I'd have to encounter this person again. And I had received a phone call from, I I believe it was my husband, who said to me that "Your, your mom's actually at the hospital where you're working right now. And my mom has had really... Uh, severe issues with her heart. She's had several ablations done. She's had to have a a surgery to essentially, but essentially had to have a surgery that um, they had to look at the electrical conductivity of her heart, shock it back into a normal rhythm. Yeah, they burn the pathways. Yes, they burn the pathways. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, I think this was several um, 
it was just after or just before her surgery, she was back in the hospital, same um, uh, arrhythmias that she was having. And I was fearful because, you know, it's it's hard. Like my mom was kind of like my rock too, right? And I got this news. And again, the fact that my husband was like, she's there. I was like, oh my goodness, like, what should I do? So I remember actually messaging our leader at the time and telling her that, you know, my mom is sick. She's here. Do you mind if I go on my lunch? And I even made it, sh- I even made sure that I was going to use my lunch time to, to visit my mom. And she was like, yeah, everything's fine. And I remember going down to see my mom and my mom was not well. And um, they were debating on whether they would admit her or whatnot, or whether they would give her some more medication to kind of, um, you know, fix the arrhythmia because she's done that before where they've done, I guess, uh, I guess it's the chemical form of a cardioversion. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went back up, like I spent my hour with her in the ED, came back up to only see that, you know, this, this individual was continuing to gaslight me throughout the day were, with, with this ridiculous email of work that I was doing with an, with a physician in terms of education. And there was this back and forth where, for example, this physician was saying to me, like, we've already had this conversation. I'm like, I know, but my leader is saying is acting like we've never had this conversation. Um, I, I finished my work knowing how stressed out I was and knowing that my mom was still in the ED department. And I had quickly sent off all the work, sent it off to um, our leader at that time. And I remember it was like, it was like four, maybe like four or four. So I was like, my day is done. I'm going down to see my mom. And I could hear her footsteps coming down the hall. And I was like, is this woman serious? And she came and she's like, I need to talk to you about this email. And I was like, what email? And she's like, the email that you just sent me. And I was like, yeah, uh, like, what do you want to talk about? She's like, she's like, you know what? There's several different things I want. I was like, hold on. Did she totally forget the fact that my mom is down there in the ED department with this heart condition, knowing that my mom's been sick, knowing how stressed I have been, and she wants to talk to me about an email to continue to gaslight me? That was like the straw for me that broke the camel's back. I was just like, you know what? You don't care about my well-being. You don't care about my mental health you would rather me suffer and continue on in this way. I don't know why organizations do this. Like, I don't know why this is, they they feel that this is okay to, you know, not support an individual with the time that they need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in here and say both to Cheryl and Amy, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. And as you're both telling your stories, I felt like there were so many similarities. Like Cheryl, with your story about being off after, you know, hardly ever having taken sick time. That was my case as well. Like when I tried to go off for my mental health issues, I'd been a nurse for, I think, 12 years. And with the exception of going on mat leave, I literally had never taken a leave of absence, you know, very little sick time. I'd never been on any sort of attendance support program. And I felt like I felt like I had to keep justifying why I needed to be off. And I was being gaslit. And I started questioning, like, do they not understand why I need to be off? Like, I'm spending more time trying to get documentation instead of taking this time to really focus on my mental health. And then even with you, Amy, like the story that you just told, I think I'd heard bits and pieces from you, but it just kind of made me wonder as well. Like when I was working in that particular organization, I was driving home from a conference. It was wintertime and I got into a car accident. And, you know, I took the next day off because I needed to sort out insurance and paperwork in my car. And then my daughter got sick. And I remember asking our leader, you know, my daughter's sick. And the response was, well, you've already been off for this one day looking at your car. You really should be prioritizing your work. And I remember being so stressed at the time because I was also new to that position that I was so afraid to take any time off that when my kids were sick, I got my mom to come watch my kids. I would rather have been home with my kids, but I was so afraid of asking for time off that I didn't know if it was justified or not that I didn't. And I really regret not standing up a bit more for myself and my mental health. But I think that people in these positions continue to get away with this behavior and there doesn't seem to be any recourse for you know their actions, 
which is a huge, I think, systemic problem in in healthcare. I I couldn't agree more, actually, because um, if you think about how sick plans or attendance programs are in institutions with lots of staff, they're often quite punitive and demeaning and almost bullying to a degree of making you feel like you shouldn't be off for certain reasons. And and, and I think think nurses come to work sick and make their colleagues sick because um, they're afraid of having to be put onto the sick plan, um, punitive meetings that you have to go to, where you feel yep. like you're, um, you're getting in trouble for um, being off too many days. So I think when COVID hit, when, when the two of you were advocating strongly for paid sick days, I think it really um, hit the healthcare workers hard because um, they've been dealing with these punitive attendance programs for years. And, you know, I don't even, I don't even know how um, that we can, we can change this way. They tend to, I always said, I always said, I felt like I was in grade school and we were all getting detention for one child who be- behaved badly in class. And you get right. that one person who's going to abuse the sick time and know how to do right. it. Don't make all of us pay for it. You know, like there's going to be times that, like my example, that I needed to be off for an extended period of time. And what I needed was support. Uh, The only support that I can say I did get at the time from my employer is I did get five sessions with my EAP program, which I have to say the woman was extremely helpful. I thought I was going for grief, but I was actually going for how to deal with how close my husband was to death. And she was on it right away. She shifted from grief to that. And she gave me five fabulous sessions. But I didn't have any more after that. I had to pay. I I had to pay for them if I wanted them. And and that's the whole piece with this EAP. And Sarah and I have talked about this numerous times where most of like, you know, thankfully, you got some sessions out of it, but your mental health challenges didn't end after those five sessions, like you still would have need support. And this is where hospitals can do a better job at incorporating better mental health plans. Like I think there are some organizations that have as little as $200. Like, I mean, I think at that point, the EAP is better because you'll, you'll get five sessions with $200, you might get one session if that, and then again, you're, you might have to start with a new provider. And that's a whole other thing, because now you're reopening up having to tell your story again, and how difficult that that is. But even just kind of bringing it back to you, Cheryl, and your your situation, it, it was it was worse than mine. Like it was your husband died. My, my dad died. Sorry, sorry, your dad died. Sorry, yeah. your dad died. And there was like, n- no support, really. And what what kind of how how were you able to work through that afterwards and what what happened with the employer afterwards well i have to say i was very fortunate to have my nursing sisters who actually were with me at the hospital with my husband two of them and they also told me um that I was not going back to work. And when I thought I was fine, they said, you are not fine and you are not going back to work because you are not going to be looking after patients the way that you should be. So because I had them telling me that, it it was enough that I knew that I needed to stay off. But when I did go back, um, I felt... I went to one of those punitive feeling meetings where they make you feel like you were off for all the wrong reasons because it wasn't physical, mm-hmm. it was mental. And they asked if I needed any supports. I said, well, you know, just let me be in the reception for a while and then I'll go back into the rooms and see how I do. So it was very early on that I, because of the shift I was on, I had to go back into one of the rooms. And it was in the middle of an extremely awful case that was not going well. And it had been up and going well for a couple of hours. But because the nurses in that room, their shifts were over, we had to go in to relieve them. And I remember saying to them, can one of you at least stay in here because you've been here for the whole time? But all of them insisted on leaving at the end of their shift. So I got tossed into the middle of this, well, we used to call them shit shows. And it wasn't much longer because the patient passed away. So then I had to deal with a death. I had to deal with the family and the spouse. I was left on my own. And I have to say that I came home from work that day and I said to my husband, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I I'd only wish that some of the people that I'd worked with had identified that I wasn't ready to go in there yet, but 
and that the, one of them would have just stayed behind and said, you know what, I'll be here with you, don't worry, and that kind of thing. But nobody did because they all just thought, oh, she's been here for 32 years, she's fine. And I wasn't at that time. I did confront um, those colleagues after and I said, you know, you shouldn't have done that to me. You, you thought I was okay, but I wasn't okay. And, mm -hmm. I, and I got through it because uh, it's what you do when you're a nurse, you you check things at the door and carry on. And I did get through the the whole evening, um, which was a tough one. That was a day I cried on the way home. <laughs> and there hasn't been that, there hasn't been a lot over the years, but there's been enough that that's how I've coped. And I just, I just wish that there had been something more in place that people would have been more aware of what was going on around them. Right, right. I think that, um, Maybe what you're speaking of is, of is like an actual accommodation for your mental health that you were going through, because if it had been written down in black and white, I think that would be pretty obvious. Like when someone comes back to work and they can't lift more than 10 pounds, it, there it is in black and white. You can't argue that. But when it's mental health and it's not treated the same as a physical problem, then people kind of use their own judgment. And you actually did ask for help. And that's not something that's easy to do, I don't think. And even then, you weren't met with the support that you needed. So... I feel like, you know, there's a lot that can really be changed in the system. Well, often what would happen when people would come back, an email would come out and they would just say that so-and-so will advocate for themselves. But even if you do, how do you get somebody to help you when you're advocating for yourself? So I found that situation hard. I did manage to work for um, two more years after that. And I was and I was good. And I think I was back to where I was. But that initial um, return to work was really tough. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Sarah hit the, the nail on the head there with um, you know, even some of those forms, right? I think it can, it should, it should be as simple as what would you like someone else to do if it was you in that situation, right? If we were to put the senior leader in that position, if we were to put the manager in that position, what would they have liked the organization to do for them? And it's just like, for whatever reason, the, the it's like the rules don't apply, right? But if we did have some type of a structured document, like the documents that they have for, you know, a physical ailment, but they had it towards mental health, I think that would be a much better form of assessment because that could say, here's the abilities I have. Here's some of my limitations. Here would be an unhealthy situation to put me in. And, you know, it would be the, the onus would be back on the employer to make sure that the worker is still coming back to do their, there's coming back to do their job, but they're be, coming back in a safe environment and they don't do that for mental health. And it's, it is quite a shame. They don't because the next year I had to have some surgery. So when I came back, they did do that. What I could do, how much I could lift. I couldn't push stretchers. I couldn't lift or, or pull patients over um, from the bed to the stretcher. Like all of those things that were, they listed things that I couldn't do physically. But when I came back from a mental thing, they didn't list the things that I couldn't do. Yeah, that's, that is absolutely the worst. And that's why we continue to say that, you know, mental health is health. And just because you can quantify, you know, how long my leg might take to heal or how long, you know, that, that knee surgery might take to heal. It's not the same as the brain. It's not the same as mental health. It's not the same as a difficult situation that an individual may be facing. And organizations must do a better job at including this as a, as a crucial aspect to making sure that their workers are healthy and thriving throughout their, their jobs. That's also a reason why we see nurses leaving in droves. They There are no real retention strategies when it comes to supporting nurses. I know money is one aspect, but we also have to look at the, the huge gaping hole of burnout, um, compassion fatigue, and really how do we help our help our employees through that. And I think this is going to be huge after COVID, like I, after COVID, during COVID. This is something that needs to have huge attention paid to it. Like just recently, I saw that there was someone who had a wedding and they're just like, I'm in my wedding dress, but I'll be back to work tomorrow because there is no time off. Or the fact that I just recently saw there was, I don't think this person was a healthcare provider, but the fact that um, she was 17 years old and her father had committed suicide the year before and she committed suicide just yesterday. Like we have to really understand that there are a lot of things impacting not just like regular people, healthcare people, and we need to deal with it. I just, 
it just is so frustrating to hear that we are still thriving and working through a healthcare system where we don't deal with mental health as significant as physical health. And I, mm-hmm. I think you're right there because um, retention is is huge. I have to say that um, after that incident, when I realized that I really didn't matter, um, I looked at my finances and figured out how I could retire early. And I left with a reduced pension, but I left right before COVID actually. I'd given my notice in January and I was leaving in April. And when I was asked my by my current manager if I would be willing to stay on for COVID, I said no. I might have said yes if that incident hadn't happened to me. And I and I think that employers need to know that if you don't treat your employees with the respect that they should be getting, they're not going to do things for you either. Like I, it was like, no, I'm leaving and I retired. Mm-hmm. And, and I yeah. think that's really sad because it was at a time where I should have rolled up my sleeves and said, how can I help? I was critically care trained. I could help. And, and it actually saddens me that I actually felt that way at the end of my career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the same time, I don't blame you. I I almost want to say, you know, good for you for standing up for yourself. Because I I keep going back to, you know, how you're treated when you did need time off for mental health and how much more different it could have been if your manager maybe was a bit more engaged, actually called you, took the time to ask how you were doing instead of getting this cold letter from the hospital, you know, saying that you shouldn't have been off. And I'm just wondering, like, if you can think back on your career, this incident or other incidents, like, what would you give some advice to new nurses that are just starting out with things that you've learned over the years that you really think nurses need to hear? Um, I think that nurses need to stand together collectively. I think they can't let individuals or small groups or pockets of people try and do the fight for all of us. Um, The union does their advocacy, RNAO does their advocacy, and within workplaces, there is nurses that, like myself, who stand up and say, that's not appropriate um, level of care for that patient, or we need to look at the skill mix here. And there's always nurses that want you to be the voice, but never want to stand beside you. They'll stand behind you and let you do it. And if I could say anything to nurses out there, new nurses, is you you need to know your collective agreement if you work in a unionized environment. You need to stand together as a group. You need to speak up for patient care and nursing practice. Like those, we're, we're accountable to a college for practice, but there's, there's managers and directors and vice presidents out there making decisions on skill mix and levels of, or not numbers of nursing, like the the ratios of how many nurses, well, there's no ratios, they, um, they just keep cutting nurses and, and then the workload gets harder. And those people are nurses a lot of times too, but they're never accountable to the college. But if something happens in a workplace because they're short staffed, it falls to the nurse who's caring for that, that patient. And it's not the decision makers that decided that we weren't going to have the number of nurses that we required to take care of that patient. And it, I, I made an example once when I was actually at the College of Nurses Council table when I was actually speaking on this issue. And I said, it's like that train wreck. And I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong, the Lac Megantic in Quebec. And all the decisions that were made to cut the staffing there um, from the higher ups fell to the two engineers that were left on the, the train that night. And they were held responsible. That is no different than nursing. That the nurses are have a level, a level of care they're expected to provide. But when employers don't give them that level or that ability to provide that care because they keep cutting nurses and diminishing the amount of time you can spend with patients, that's what you're going to get. And and I think patients need to know that. I've watched it over the years. I call them bean counters. They just keep cutting the staffing instead of looking at other ways to make savings. I think that over the years, it's been like sicker patients, heavier workloads, staff have been cut and it's almost like they want they want to keep cutting until you say something because they know that nurses a lot of nurses will just take this right and think that somehow they've got to improve their level of efficiency or whatnot and they just put it on you to say something versus doing what's right and doing the the right thing and what's going to prevent burnout and nurses leaving and i just feel like you're right cheryl because a lot of people 
they stand behind you. They stand in your shadow. You know, they want to be anonymous. They they cheer us on, Amy and I, but they're not willing to do a little bit of that work either. But they're very happy for the work that we've done. And I think that it starts from the time you're in nursing school to know what a nurse is and what your responsibility is in advocacy. And it's not just standing back and let, letting somebody speak for you. Um, it's actually getting out there and developing the skill of speaking up for yourself, advocating for yourself and not just your patients, caring for yourself and not just your patients. This is something that we all really need to start doing for ourselves. And and I think that, you know, over the years, I have to say that um, because I've been a strong voice um, that way, it's been quite detrimental to me <laughs> because um, I've, I've experienced bullying because of that. And it's like, I can't say it's from all my managers. I had one manager that said to me that she would sit in a meeting when she was going to announce something. She didn't know if it was going to be popular or not. And she would say to me, she said to me later, I always looked at your face because I knew if I was on the right track or not. And and I I laughed and I thought that showed complete respect for me because she knew that I would say, yeah, you can pull that off or no, you can't pull that off. And so she, did she use me? Absolutely. But it was for the benefit of the nurses and the unit. But then I had other managers that if I would do the, like I would say, you know, I'm not sure if that's good for patient care, or I'm not sure if the nurses are going to be able to do that. Or I don't know if that's within their scope of practice um, when they wanted to bring in someone else. I had other um, managers that were, they were bullies. And that's the only way that I can describe it. And it really actually made my work life quite miserable at at times. And I I then got to the point of just keeping my mouth shut. And I didn't feel good about myself doing that, but I, I had to do it for my own mental well-being. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I, and I think this is where we talk about advocacy and there's been like a long standing history of silencing and nursing. So I, I don't want people to forget that, you know, for a very long time, we were told to be in the shadows. We, we were expected to be the supporting character and not the, the, the main person talking about issues or concerns with healthcare or concerns with patients. It was mainly like, physicians, our colleagues. I do feel that there's a little bit of a groundswell. There is a little bit of change coming. I think that, you know, it's good to see other nurses in media, other nurses speaking up. Like, for example, there's going to be a protest next week where nurses are talking about um, some of the issues that we see in terms of Bill 124 and some of the cuts that we're seeing in nursing. And I think that, you know, change is coming. But this is where I want to urge, like, you know, universities, colleges, nursing schools, you know, here and far in between that we need to teach advocacy like this at the education level. So we can, you know, we have nurses coming out feeling equipped to become advocates because I don't think that it's some, it's definitely not something that they teach in, in nursing school, this form of advocacy, but I mean, you know, through your own years of experience, Cheryl, and just through the fact that myself and Sarah said, we've had friggin' enough too, that we we decided to um, share our stories and share other people's stories and, and let people have a true uh, illustration of what nursing is. But I think that advocacy piece is is so important. And, and I don't want you to shut your mouth. I want you to keep speaking up, even if you're, you feel that you're not in the role to do it. I think it doesn't matter where you are as a nurse, whether you're at the bedside, whether you're retired, whether you are still in the thick of it. I think that you still have an opportunity to speak up. And if you can, you should. Well, don't worry, I have because I'm currently (laughs) working in a vaccine clinic. And there was a a bit of a time and we're still having a bit where there's some, there's a bit of hostility and aggression toward the vaccine nurses right now for people who um, are feeling pressured to get the vaccine because of employers or being able to enter hockey arenas and things like that. I did speak up saying that I felt that we needed a bit more of a security presence there at the door when people come in to know that we have security there. Um, One of the nurses that I work with told me she got called a 
um, I'm not even, I can't say it on the air, actually. It was, um, it was offensive. And all she was, was the vaccine nurse giving the vaccine for this person um, who came in for it because her employer was making her get it or making, or, you know, how they're saying, if you were, if you want to work here, you have to be vaccinated. I have to say the vaccine clinic, though, has been a, a sweet little host retirement job that I went back to, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so it has kind of re- re- rekindled my love for nursing. That's amazing, Cheryl. I think it's great that you're still giving back. Like I know you don't consider yourself at the bedside anymore, but this is really great that you're still able to use your skills and compassion to do the vaccinations. I read recently that there was a nurse in Quebec who was punched by a patient um, over some sort of altercation around vaccinations. So I think that it still continues to be an issue. You know, we deal with violence on the job. I think that's a whole nother topic in itself. But I, I really appreciate all of the tidbits that you shared with us. I think that we could go on for hours if we wanted to. But um, I just wondered if there was anything else you wanted to add before we uh, we wrap up this episode. Only that I've I've loved listening to your program. Um, when I first retired, I would um, be in the basement with my sewing machine and the podcast on and listening. And I, I think I was talking to you many times um, through the iPad that I was listening to it on. Um, but you really do hit home what um, what is the reality of nursing, and you you touch on the topics that that nurses do want to talk about. Um, we always had um, a nurses week where we tried to get media exposure in newspapers and radio stations and TV. Where I worked, um, or the union that I was um, affiliated with, was always quite successful in doing that, but it was only for a week. And then another year went by. And I think that podcasts like yours and um, and even the uh, mainstream media that's interviewing nurses, I think it's so very important that they hear what's really going on out there so people know uh, the day-to-day um, stressors that nurses are dealing with. I thank you for listening to my story. I I appreciate it. I appreciate you letting me share it. And um, I hope that it helps other people. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for being on the Gritty Nurse podcast. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming. And you know, now now you'll get to hear your own voice on our show. So that'll be a treat. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much.